Funding for this program is provided by Annenberg CPD to advance excellent teaching. There's plenty of evidence to demonstrate that the American high school is a failure. American students score consistently lower on most achievement tests than their counterparts in nearly every industrialized country. 30% of our high school students drop out, and another 20% graduate without marketable skills. That's a 50% failure rate. Why is it that so many of our young people are either dropouts or truants from high school? Perhaps because they don't see much connection between school and the so-called real world. This school's different. It requires an internship, giving students a chance to learn some real-life skills. These young people, for example, are working with a veteran documentarian to learn the tricks of the television trade. I'm John Merrow. Welcome to Learning Matters. The production and broadcast of Learning Matters have been made possible by the Lilly Endowment, Incorporated, of Indianapolis, Indiana. Additional funding for this edition of Learning Matters has been provided by the Ford Foundation. Our story actually began 17 years ago in Queens, New York City, with an experimental high school on this college campus. The idea? Take adolescents of at least average intelligence who were having difficulty in traditional schools and treat them like college students. More freedom, fewer rules, and higher expectations, plus a work requirement. The experiment's name, Middle College High School, suggests its hybrid nature, a high school in the middle of a college. It's been a success in New York, an 85% graduation rate with most graduates going on to college. Can that success be transplanted to other cities, including Los Angeles? This middle college high school, nine classrooms in these two rows of buildings, began two years ago with nearly 100 10th graders. It now has both 10th and 11th grades and 190 students. Most of the youngsters are potential dropouts, and if they did not attend school at middle college, whether it would be this year or the next year or whenever, they certainly more than likely would become one of the dropout statistics. But Principal Battersby, who also teaches two classes, says that the job of middle college high school is more than mere schooling. You're trying to focus them in on planning for their life as opposed to just letting it happen. In a situation and in a community where you've got youngsters and you'll ask them, what are you going to be doing when you're 21 years old? And they'll tell you without bat batting an eye and without even hesitating, well, I'll be dead. That pessimism is of a piece with what most teachers here see as their students' low self-esteem. These two faculty members, Irvin Montier and Moses Robinson, have combined their psychology and creative writing classes for a unit on racism and self-respect. The rise in racism that we see in the nation, we need to first of all identify what kind of profile a person is. Now we're going to talk about the concepts, psychological concepts of racism. What about referring to each other in derogatory terms? What do you think or believe that does for your self-esteem? How many of us walk around and uh, refer to each other in such a derogatory sense? Most Because it's a habit. You did it for so long. And then once you learn, once you learn what you're doing, it's, you stop and it takes a while. Like, I feel like this, if Duncan called me a nigga, I wouldn't have no effect on that because he a nigga too. He rocking in the same boat as I am. Okay, but do you understand that it was first used as a derogatory term? Yes, I understand that. And do, are you using it in a derogatory sense? No, I'm not using it in a different situation. It is derogatory. And we can't avoid it from being derogatory, and we can't move away from that. Because if it wasn't derog derogatory, why would you respond so hostile when someone outside of your environment calls you nigger? You no, know, it's like a day-to-day like -day term everybody uses. You know, it's like, 
All right, every day you hear somebody saying, what's up, nigga, my man, nigga, you know, something like that. See, really, they don't know no better because, see, you got some people, when you call them that, they be like, no, that ain't my name. My name is Tom or something like that because they know better and they know where the term come from. But people that don't know and been brought up that way, they just going to say it to be saying it. But a person that know about it, they going to be like, no, nah, don't call me that. But it's just a day-to-day -day -day thing. That's all you hear. We're about right now restoring our culture. We got to be busy about it giving ourselves culture. So low self-esteem will be turned into now high self-esteem, being confident in ourselves. We feel that the problem of racism uh, stems from a historical context. And the fact that they are calling each other niggers perhaps uh, is never phased them where it, where it originated. Once they find the, uh, the origination, then we'll know what kind of work we have to do to rectify the problem. And so what com becomes common language of just nigger, nigger, nigger every day? will have its roots into the reasons why you're saying it. And therefore, it stems on racism. It was racism that gave them the name. It's racism, and it's going to be a kind of uh, cultural uh, restoration that's going to rid us of saying it. So that's the significance of it. You know, and nigger has always been derogatory, you know. So if you, if you don't want that to take place outside the culture, then how can you begin to criticize someone outside the culture when you actually being a participant of your own type of a racism that you supposedly are despising. So they need to be educated on that. I got the sense, listening, watching the class, that, that both of you um, have uh, are, are a combination. You're part teacher, but you're also part preacher. I think that rubbed <laughs> off on me from him. <laughs> Is that... And I think that's a pretty good that assessment, is, yeah. I think. That it is a moral message. Now, you say moral. Yeah, it, it's a cultural message uh, that's in, that needs to be uh, conveyed to them. This is a message that needs to be given to the so-called upper class, middle class, or, or all the way up to the rich, very rich, as far as the African-American uh, people are concerned. Um, but you won't find that kind of blatant disrespect, uh, misuse of the word nigger in, say, in a middle class, upper middle class high school, I would think. And it's not to demean the kids here. But uh, this is inner city Los Angeles, and uh, we're in the heart of it. And so, therefore, the message has to go with that moralistic fever that you were just talking about. I'd have to approach it with that way. Well, what's that have to do with creative writing? That's what you teach. Kids, students will write something they're interested in. So rather than get them to try and create some type of uh, fictional short story, then they would much rather write about something that's, hey, it, it, it's occurring with me right now. You know, I'm dealing with uh, having problems with blacks in my community or they having problems with me. I can bring that to paper. I can bring that to life. I can write that. Making it real is also important to this man, Kevin Kennedy, who teaches economics as well as this course, World Futures, at Middle College High School. Several weeks ago, he divided his class into six groups, each representing an imaginary country. Their job? Create a new world order in the aftermath of a devastating world war. The most perplexing problem is what to do with all the military weapons, the bombs, planes, guns, tanks, and so forth. Should the winner, Caxico, keep them all, divide them up, or destroy them, that is, disarm? Juan Carlos Ochoa is one of the representatives from Coxico. No, we're making your proposal. If you don't want it, we'll make our own laws. You didn't hear the, com the compliments or the comments about the other countries? Well, we're, telling, we're giving you a proposal. Do y'all want it or we make our own laws? Well, just let them talk and, you know, they'll I get some reasons. Like he said, we, are the, the, we have a power to just demand it. We want to live this world as, like, one country. We're the leaders. We just say what you know, we have to do and that's it. We just giving you. We're gonna be kind to give you guys, you know, this. Decide what y'all want. Yeah. Well, you guys want. You guys want to do what you guys want. We just could just straight out, you know, get together and demand the rules. Let me clarify what Juan just said. He said, as the the nation of the world that basically was the leader in the conquering nations won the war. He says that currently they have the power to dictate to the world what proposals they want. But they're being benevolent. That means to be kind. They're being a benevolent nation in leading the new world order. And they're going to let you make a decision. But of course you must realize that if they don't agree, 
agree, we'll, we'll do it our Vito. way. We'll do it our way. Now, that ain't right. Ain't we? So what? But we can gang up again and overthrow you. So you better watch out. Watch your back. The ones, yo, so what the people in that country can't do? They put fear on them. They can't gang up on you and overthrow you. You are putting fear on us. They overthrow your leader. Is that what y'all want? Y'all want to uh, fight us again? That's what no, y'all want? That's what y'all want? The, the question comes down to the proposal that Troy made is that we should have one nation or a group of nations that police f spheres of influence in the world. Coxico contends it's not necessary if we all disarm. Now, the question is, do you agree with Coxico? Is it in your self-interest as a nation to disarm? Or do you anticipate rebuilding your military forces and striking again to try and recover what authority or power that you may have had prior to them? Hitler all over again. We have to rebuild because there'll be Hitler all over again. One nation trying to overcome all these, I mean, one country, um, simple imperialism. It'll be imperialism, all of communists. We will have to be all equal again. We'll be that'll be having us being communists. So what we're like, saying is really we don't we don't want to to um, go with the law that they have to forgiving us the country without any military supplies. We want to still have military supplies so we can get our country strong enough to strike back. Go ahead, David. This is now, the country now, of Krypton. This country agree with Caxico now. Now, if they was to go back to war with them, we don't want no part of it because we want peace and they want to go back to war. I agree with the peace treaty because um, if you guys are just taking all the military away, it's all right because then, you know, there won't be no, you know, no, no versus no conflict against nobody. Like you were saying, you want to go to war, you, you want to get your military forces to get back strong and strike back. We have the, the two other main countries besides us willing, you know, uh, going for our peace treaty. Now you have Krypton that's falling ours and sweet peace. What are you gonna do now? We don't have to be embarrassed to you just because we lost. It's the whole world. We have a country too. Y'all forget who won the war. Like oh Lewis said, look, look, listen, I got the floor now. I got the floor. Like Lewis said, we're being so kind to give y'all y'all land back and we're still gonna pay half the half on um, whatever it takes to reconstruct. And you guys are still going against us. I mean you guys are in no position to go against us again. Does it surprise you when the kids get so involved? Uh, no, not necessarily they get involved in a discussion with each other. It surprises me when they get uh, very adamant or uh, emotional about an international situation because they don't relate often to uh, international politics. Um, but when they begin to put it in a simulation and you try to parallel world conditions, and then identify nations as fictitious nations, but they have very significant uh, uh, parallels to actual nations. Uh, then they can begin to relate to it because they, they bring in all these things that are, they're experiencing in their own world, right here in their community. Uh, conflicts between gangs, conflicts between individuals, and they would still think of solutions to the world order in the same terms that they deal in daily. Power is gonna win and um, they'll discuss world peace. They'll discuss being egalitarian. But ultimately, they view themselves as being either victims or the predator. Avoiding predators in their own community is one reason attendance is high at Middle College High School, according to Kennedy. This school has been a safe haven. Um, many of the kids will come to school that they wouldn't attend a regular high school, go to Washington High School, which is up the street from us, a comprehensive high school. They won't go there because of the constant threat that they're under. And the youngsters who may not be participating in gang activity or, or into the confrontations are, are caught up in it, too, because they're in the halls when it's happening. So they come here and they think this is a nice, safe place to attend school. And they come in great numbers. We have a high attendance on site. Now, our task as teachers is to get them in the rooms and educate them. When we come back, what happens when energetic, boisterous 15 and 16 year olds take college courses? The, some of the research that was presented to us in our investigation suggested that parents are providing seven negative comments to kids for every one positive. So it really, for us to be more conscious about our criticism, um, is, it, is it just out of habit? Is it what we had gotten? So 
looking for opportunities to really reinforce positive behavior. Two, engaging the kids in mutual goal setting. A lot of kids growing up today, particularly young ones, don't have a, a sense of starting and following through and completing something. And, and oftentimes are presented with something that they think, I, no way I can do that. For parents to take the time, and it means, all of this means taking the time, um, to sit down and work out um, a series of things, the first ones being maybe the easiest. And after a few of those, all of a sudden the child starts experiencing positive reinforcement that, gee, I decided to do that and look at I accomplished it, brushing my teeth regularly for a young child. Um, I can move on to other things. And feeling the self-confidence. Um, and also three, God, the, in, most of the people who would listen to something like this probably already know this, but of separating criticism of behavior from the person. Just because you do something that might really rankle me, um, it doesn't mean that you're a bad person. And I need to say, John, I really care about you, but what you did really was inappropriate. I prefer the coffee to the Ritalin. Because An important and not always successful part of the experiment at Middle College High School is enrollment in classes at the sponsoring college. Here, 10th and 11th graders take classes at Los Angeles Southwest College, including this child development class taught by Dr. Patricia McClenahan. The thing that I noticed the most about it is there were a lot of dropouts. I think I only have four left. I must have had, I must have had at least 10 to begin with. And they have dropped out or they don't attend class. And uh, they come in and they say, have I been, uh, am I still in your class? And I say, let me check the role. And I check the role and say, where have you been for six weeks? And they go, mm hmm. They have some excuse, my grandmother died, I went to Mexico. Uh, they don't realize that you have to be in class. It's very possible that uh, some of the people are too egocentric, you know, too uh, inflated with their feeling of importance. But this is what we're here for. We're here to provide students a good education, as good as we can provide. And there's nothing in the contract that says that these students have to be X number of years old or younger than X number of years. We're here for people, and that's the name of the game. And again, you're asked to find the solution set. Jim King's Algebra now, two class includes five students from the high school who generally like being in college classes. At first it was hard to adjust, but as time went on, it was okay. But um, college students are more responsible, I guess, than high school students. Because in high school, you have bells and you have to be at a certain class at a certain time. But in college, you don't have to. Um, they don't have bells, so therefore it's upon you mm -hmm. to go to class. And sometimes it's hard because you're so used to being pushed. It was weird being with the adults and we're the only kids right here. But then you get used to it. It's like since the teachers aren't telling you, you must be in class, um, pressuring, you. pressuring you, then if you feel like going to um, McDonald's or whatever, you just get up and go. Or like with the homework with Mr. King, he expects you to have your homework in on Fridays, but it's not like all through the week he's constantly telling you, get your homework in, get your homework in. On Friday, you're just supposed to have your homework. and. If people aren't constantly telling you, then sometimes you can just forget about it, and that's, that's hard. So getting used to um, the freedom was the most difficult thing in the world for me. Adults may classify these young people as potential dropouts or at-risk youth, but the students I talked with do not see themselves that way. I don't consider it like that because I've never been dropped out, I've never been a failure or nothing. And most of my friends and most of the people are here and they're not, not here for that. Some of the students are gifted. Some of the students have attendance problems. Like myself, I had an attendance problem and I could not work in a comprehensive high school. I just couldn't handle being around a thousand students all day long, being told what to do, what to do. How do the college teachers treat you? It just depends on what, who the teacher and who the students are and their behavior. Mm -hmm. some, some teachers... They like just, they, they yeah, they don't want you. They just want the adults There's some in teachers yeah. that don't really want you in class, yeah. but there's some that really nice. Like this class, we don't know. Mr. King really likes, it doesn't matter who you are. He, Tell me he just the ones who don't like you. How do, they, how do you know that? Well, they all, you know, like making <laughs> bad faces when you turn your work on. They're all they all bad. bad. They treat you bad. They're always picking on you, you know. 
uh, well, you drop yeah. the class. <laughs> and they're always like putting young people down as a whole, not individually, but it seems like most of the teachers that really can't deal with young people, maybe they feel like we're disputations, maybe they feel like we're um, inexperienced and so they don't want to deal with us because I know one teacher told me that she's, she, has, she doesn't come here to babysit and she says that that's what she's doing when we're in her class, she's babysitting us. Do you drop the class? No, that's the last thing you want to do is drop a class because of a teacher. That's when you keep on going and pushing to let them know you can't handle the class. When we come back, what the future may hold for this experiment in education. Baby talk. Mm -hmm. Should I talk baby talk to my baby or real language? I think your baby expects you to talk real language to him or her because your baby wants very much to learn real language. And uh, if you wish to talk baby talk, uh, fine, but it is not going to, uh, going to help. You really want to do a lot of talking early on with kids, even when they don't look like they're, like they're understanding you. Um, and, you know, sometimes people look as though they're a little bit bats, you know, they're walking along and talking to their child who may even be sleeping. But nevertheless, language and sharing of lots of words is terribly important for kids to develop no, lots of good um, language skills. No, it's a bit baby. Well, if you really feel like it, but that, you know, that isn't going to teach real language. I don't want to go home. <laughs> The Middle College High School here in Los Angeles is only two years old. It won't have its first graduation until June 1992. School officials say that only three students have left the school in two years, one early sign of success by any measure. But Principal Natalie Battersby says there's never a reason or an opportunity to rest on one's laurels. You say a prayer all the way to work, that you do the right things and say the right things because you know that there's going to be something new that's going to come up and uh, and you always are looking at them in terms of where they are and where they want to go which is what I said earlier you know not what I want to be not what I'm gonna be but thank God I'm not what I was I'd have to say that we're ahead of the power curve in spite of all the difficulties and slings and arrows of outrageous fortune that we've uh, suffered up to this point but uh, the, the, the rewards offset any difficulties that we had and I come here new day after day ready to go to work and look forward to adversity so we can overcome them. I think we're doing excellent I really do because being an inner city product um, then I know for most of these kids if it was not a situation such as this one that they would be lost they'd get lost in the big numbers no doubt about it um the idea sounds wonderful. Um, the theory of being on a college campus and having the kids motivated and emulating the college students, in theory, sounds great. In practice, it hasn't really taken off to the degree that I would expect it to. With this type of setting, then you can reach those kids, and you can reach them in uh, large numbers, you know, and you can be satisfied. And as an educator, you can go home feeling good because uh, in comprehensive high school, then it's just so many kids that come through you during the course of a day that have problems that there's just no way one human being can tackle. This is the best job I've ever had in 16 years. I uh, have enjoyed uh, immensely. I probably had more commitment to the kids in, on an individual basis for my own personal relationship with the students here than I've ever had. Dances, um, <laughs> activities, everything is gone. We, we're just here for school, for work, 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 work. But All day. Still here? No, we're still here. But we have a we have a better chance of. But that's the most important thing. Our academic work. I mean, we can play after school or, you know, make our own club. But you know, we have to make money <laughs> with work. Really. But that's not the last word. The real last word will come from the Los Angeles School Board, which, because of a budget deficit of nearly $350 million, is looking for ways and places to cut. Will Middle College High School survive? At this point, nobody knows. Well, that's it for this edition of Learning Matters. What's the point? School can be interesting. I'm John Merrow. Thanks for being with us. See you next time. To find out more about this program, Visit us at PBS Online at the Internet address on your screen. The production and broadcast of Learning Matters have been made possible by the Lilly Endowment, Incorporated of Indianapolis, Indiana. 
Additional funding for this edition of Learning Matters has been provided by the Ford Foundation. Funding for this program is provided by Annenberg CPB to advance excellent teaching. For information about this and other Annenberg CPB programs, call 1-800-LEARNER and visit us at www.learner.org.